the way that you've tried to save energy during the summer. Welcome everybody to this installment of the University of Minnesota Extension's No Place Like Home series. This webinar is called Home Energy Beat the Heat. And I can guarantee the past few weeks you have been uh, feeling the heat for sure. So before we dive in, we're gonna start off with a little poll. Uh, are you here for your own interest, for your job position, or a combination of the two? I'm just gonna give us 30 seconds to click on our option here. Oh yeah, all right, I'm liking what I see. So we've got a lot of people for personal use and personal and professional use. And the slides here. I'm gonna leave these instructions to turn on closed captioning for anybody that uh, wants to utilize that feature, you just go down and hit captions. And if you don't see it there, you can hit the three dots with more and you should find it there. We four presenters are here on behalf of CERTS, which is the clean energy resource teams. We'll talk extensively about the services uh, we can provide. My name is Dominic Erickson. And like the other three here, I am a sustainability project coordinator with CERTS. And I'll let every, everyone introduce themselves as we go along. This webinar is produced by Rose. She will be helping with tech issues of which I'm positive there will be zero. Uh, she'll be keeping her eyes on the chat and conveniently popping links into the chat as they come up in the presentation. So if and when something piques your interest, I'll let uh, uh, you can go right to the link in the chat because Rose is on the scene. All right. My name is Jordan Sliger, and I'm a sustainability coordinator in the central region of Minnesota over in Brainerd. And today we're going to be going over what CERTS is as an organization, how to make your home comfortable and efficient, a deeper dive into air source heat pumps, tackling energy burden in your community, and then a question and answer at the end. So if you think of any questions during the presentation, feel free to think of them up and put them in the chat at the end whenever we're taking questions. So let's get started. All right. So the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTS, is a statewide partnership with a shared mission to connect individuals and their communities to the resources that they need to identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. So we empower communities and their members to adopt energy conservation, energy efficiency, renewable energy technologies and practices for their homes, businesses, local institutions. We're basically a bridge to connect people to the resources that they need um, to facilitate clean energy. So how does the University of Minnesota kind of fit into that picture? Well, the um, CERT statewide office is based at the University of Minnesota Extension Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, and it serves as RSDP's energy program. Um, CERT also has a number of partners, and those partners are um, the University of Minnesota Extension, RSDP, the Great Plains Institute, the Minnesota Commerce Department, and the Southwest Regional Development Commission. So how does CERTS help facilitate these clean energy projects? We provide hands-on assistance for cities, counties, utilities, farmers, businesses, and other organizations looking to make a change in their energy use. We provide practical steps to clean energy in the form of resources for getting started, moving forward, and finalizing projects and by creating learning opportunities, by hosting events, creating resources, and highlighting clean energy stories and jobs. 
So making your home comfortable and efficient, what are some of the first steps you can do to do that? Getting to know your home's energy use is a really good first step. You typically check your utility bill for that. And then next, you want to start with some of the easier energy saving tips, like simple behavior changes, switching to LED light bulbs, and um, then you'd move on to the bigger stuff like heating and cooling that can be, you know, 55% of your air conditioning and heating uh, is your energy bill. 55% of heating and air conditioning is your energy bill. Um, once you've completed like the low hanging fruit, you can move on to upgrading your heating and cooling and looking for more energy efficient systems. And if you're wanting to find any of these slides or home energy guides, they're available on our website to use with your own branding um, and for outreach. And so getting to know your home energy basically starts with your utility bill. You can avoid a lot of the scary fees and stuff on the bottom there and just focus on your total electricity used and the monthly usage data that your bill will send you. That can often be a really useful way to figure out um, discrepancies, figure out what's using a lot of energy. A lot of the time, um, you can't do a lot about the fees, but if you had anything that was coming up that was really kind of um, throwing you for a loop and you couldn't explain why you were getting such high bills for something, you could talk to the Citizens Utility Board and schedule an energy bill consultation, and they'd be able to sit down with you and talk with you over the phone with over your specific energy bill and see if there's anything that's kind of out of the ordinary there. And a typical Minnesota home will use about 800 kilowatt hours of electricity per month. So the monthly usage data can be a great tool in determining what uses a lot of energy in your home. Like for instance, in this um, energy bill here, you can see that the first peak is whenever the furnace went out during the winter. And so the home was heated with space heaters for a week. Space, space heaters are very inefficient, so they often aren't a good option. The next peak is that they just had summer air conditioning, so that's kind of a typical um, cost that you'd be using your energy on. And then you can see in, in December, they had uh, non-LED holiday lights, and so those were incandescent bulbs instead of LED, and it used a lot more energy than they expected. And then the final end peak was after an electric vehicle was purchased, and so they started to charge their vehicle at home. So this will be a quick little trivia question. Why should you use LED bulbs? And if you could just put in the chat, um, it could be one or more answers, but A, B, C, or a combination of them. Is it that they are energy efficient, they contain no mercury, or that they last a long time? Okay. Seeing a lot of C's and all of the above. It's actually going to be all of them. And so essentially, um, they're about 75% more energy efficient than incandescent bulbs. They don't have mercury like fluorescent bulbs, and they can last up to 25 times longer than a typical incandescent bulb. So they're a lot better choice to save money and energy. If you want to figure out how to upgrade your lighting and you're, you have a, a bit more specific questions than just going to LED, the search has a right light guide and app to figure out um, a good option for upgrades. So another trivia question really quick, which label helps you identify energy efficient products whenever you're looking to upgrade things like lighting and appliances? Is it A, Energy Star, B, EPA approved, or C, Energy Star? Seeing a lot of Cs, and you guys are correct. It is Energy Star. 
So when you're looking to uh, replace an appliance, look for the Energy Star logo. It's the blue one in the bottom right of the slide. Um, refrigerators are especially a big deal. They're on average around 7 to 15% of a home's energy use, and upgrading an old refrigerator can be a really big deal. Uh, they often quali qualify for utility rebates as well, so definitely check on that. So reducing your water heating is another way to save a lot of money on your bill. Uh, installing water sense faucet aerators and water efficient shower heads can reduce the amount of hot water you're using. You can set your water heater temperature at 120 degrees Fahrenheit to save energy and reduce the chance of burns. If you don't know what the temperature is on your water heater, it typically is 120 degrees by default, but you can check with a, a household thermometer running under hot water that you turn on to its maximum for about 30 seconds. And then um, you can turn it down if it's too hot. You can use cold water for washing clothes and take shorter showers as well. So a really big thing is to check for utility programs. Oftentimes utilities will offer free programs for their um, customers and that can be things like uh, payment plans, rebates, energy efficient items, and energy assessments. Uh, a lot of the um, programs that they offer are income qualified, but not all of them. They have a lot of energy efficiency that they're trying to spread out into the community. So definitely go onto your local utility website and check in with them. Some of the key questions around energy bills, who's paying your utility bill? Is it the renter, your landlord? How much do they usually cost? And has there been an energy assessment done on the building? So an energy assessment is basically whenever an expert comes out to your home and checks for a bunch of different um, places where you can improve upon and might even install some stuff for you, depending on the program. You can go get these energy assessments oftentimes through your electric or gas utility if they offer that program um, through the Minnesota RETAP or the Weatherization Assistance Program, which is income qualified. You have to file an, an application with the Energy Assistance Program and it opens up in October. But um, if you go get a, an energy assessment and you pay for it, there's also a tax credit that you can file for like $150 off of your taxes to get one done. But they could be a really good option for someone to, that's an expert to come and give you a lot of advice. All right, so we're going to move into making your home comfortable and efficient with some cooling and heating. I'm Morgan. I'm also a sustainability coordinator, but I work with the Northeast region up in Duluth. Oh, goodness. There we go. All right, so insulation. Insulation ratings are measured in R value per inch of thickness. The R value is essentially just a math calculated number that tells you how well that insulation prevents heat from leaving or from entering your home. It can vary by type. So we got all these, these different types that insulation could come in in blankets, blown in, or the ones that provide air sealing. And it can vary by thickness and density. A higher R value is going to be better, but it's also more likely to be more expensive. Insulation is key in keeping those that nice climate controlled air inside your house that we're working so hard to do. It's a little bit harder to change on your own, but it is a good thing to note as we're looking at energy efficiency. So insulation is going to be in your attic. In your attic, you want to have a really high R value because that's where a lot of your heat's going to escape from. So often that means your insulation is gonna be 12 to 20 inches in your attic. In your basement, you're gonna want some rigid foam outside, but not fiberglass inside. As much as fiberglass looks like cotton candy, it does a little bit act like cotton candy, in which when it is more likely to get wet, like in places where your basement, it's not a great fit because it can get a little melted and mildewy, which is not great for your indoor air for your indoor air quality. In walls, you want some fiberglass vents or dense pack cellulose. Again just to keep that nice air inside your house, climate controlled as you want it. Everything you've ever wanted to know about insulation can be found at energy.gov slash insulation. They've got a lot more math numbers and a lot more explanations on all the different types of insulation that are available. So we're looking at air sealing. So air sealing is gonna be related to your insulation. 
because in all those little gaps and places of your house, there can be this thing called air infiltration. It's not the same as ventilation. Ventilation is more air coming in and out of your home that you have approved. You've opened a window, you've turned your bathroom fan on, you want that air circulating. Air infiltration is um, best noted in all these little yellow spots on this map. And it's places where air is coming in that you don't necessarily want. So places like garage walls, um, certain types of floors, those little gaps in your windows. And you want to seal those air leaks because that's just your nice, warm or cool air just escaping right out of your house. So to seal those air leaks, you can use stuff like caulk, spray foam, or spray foam, or for larger gaps, fillers that are made of cotton, fiberglass foam, or sponge rubber. There's an entire aisle at the Menards dedicated to this, and I'm sure there is at other hardware stores. So you should take a look at your options and see what is best for the spaces that you have in your home. We also have thermostat options. So we're talking about controlling the temperature. You have different ways of doing so in your house. You, there's manual thermostats, which holds a set temperature until someone changes it. Energy can be wasted with a manual thermostat because the temperature is kept high or to the same temperature unless someone goes and touches it. So even if nobody's home, it's always going to be at that same temperature. So if it's running really cold and you're at work, you're at the store, you're on vacation, that's just wasting energy. Nobody's there. Nobody's enjoying that nice air conditioning. So a programmable thermostat allows occupants to program different temperatures for different times of the week or days of the week. And it can also include vacation and other override settings. So if you know, for instance, you're always at work during nine to five, you can set it so that maybe your house is a little bit warmer during nine to five, you're not spending as much on air conditioning and nobody has to worry about being sweaty in their house because you're not even in there during that time. A smart thermostat does a very similar principle. However, it's Wi-Fi enabled, so occupants can monitor and control it remotely. So unlike a programmable one, you do still have to push the buttons on the thermostat itself. A smart one, you can operate from your phone. So maybe you don't have such a consistent schedule. But when you're leaving your house, you're on the train out to work, out to hang out by the lake, you can turn that air conditioning off no energy used, your home is gonna be a little bit warmer while you're not there. And when you're on the train back, you can turn that air conditioning back on and your house will be nice and cool for you when you get home. Again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about air conditioning. Air conditioners cool and dehumidify. They should be properly sized for the room that they're cooling and they should be cleaned regularly, which helps with their efficiency and helps improve your indoor air quality. If you're purchasing a new unit, you should look for Energy Star and a higher energy efficiency rating. You could also, instead of perhaps a window unit, consider an air source heat pump, and Caitlin's gonna tell you about those in a minute. You could also consider a swamp cooler. These have been used for thousands of years, documented all the way back to ancient Egypt. And in low humidity areas, it's a type of evaporative cooling that provides a low energy way of staying cool. By passing air over water-saturated pads, the water in the pads evaporates, which reduces the air temperature coming out of them by 15 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. These use about one-fourth the energy of a standard AC unit, so they're a really good option if perhaps you don't have the budget for an AC unit or you don't have the budget for that amount of utility expenses. They are, however, a swamp cooler for a reason. So as that air evaporates, it is going to make the cool air that's coming out very humid. So these work best in either low humidity areas or in tangent with a dehumidifier. And for a DIY option, maybe the hardware stores are closed or you just don't wanna go out right now, it's really hot. You can use a fan directly in front of a bowl of ice or a stretched out wet towel to utilize that same evaporative cooling principle and cool yourself down really quickly. Again, we're spending all this effort and money on providing a nice temperature inside your home. You don't need to try to heat or cool the outdoors. The outdoors is very big and often it's very cold in Minnesota. You could run your furnace all you want, but it's not going to make the outdoors any warmer in Minnesota. <laughs> so make sure you close all your windows and doors when you're running the furnace or the air conditioner. Fans, we love fans. 
You can use window fans to make use of free cool air at night, and they should always blow in and not out. Indoor fans cool people, not rooms, so you should turn them off when you're not in the room. I've always thought up until very recently that my ceiling fan made the room much cooler, so I should leave it on when I'm not in the house so that when I come back, my room will still be nice and cool, but that's not the case. Uh, ceiling fans and other indoor fans don't actually change the air temperature. They change the way that you, the person, feel the air temperature, like a wind chill. So they actually don't affect the air temperature and you are okay to turn them off when you're not in the room. We also have this cool Corsi Rosenthal cube. Now we wanna keep our windows open at night, get use of that nice free cool air. However, especially this year and especially in the summer, the outside air quality isn't great and has a lot of particulate pollutants that we don't necessarily want to be breathing in. So you can make a Corsi Rosenthal cube as an inexpensive do-it-yourself air cleaner, or you could also get an air purifier, but this is cooler and you can do it yourself. It can be easily constructed out of a box fan and four furnace filters and makes a nice little cube. And that can be used to filter that air when you're getting the nice, clean outside air, maybe not so clean, just to improve your indoor air quality a little bit. So looking back on heating and cooling, we have some key questions. So what kinds of heating and cooling systems does the home have? What is it operating on? And who is scheduling regular heating system maintenance? If there's a furnace filter, who's responsible for changing it out every month? Who's responsible for doing routine cleanings? And is the thermostat programmable or is it smart? Can we install a smart thermostat? And does the resident know how to use all the features that might be associated with a smart thermostat? All right, and now Caitlin is gonna tell you about air source heat pumps. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Swanson, also an AmeriCorps Sustainability Coordinator down in the Southeast region in Rochester, and we're going to talk some about air source heat pumps. I don't know about you all, but here at CERTS, it's everything's air source heat pumps right now. People are very, very excited because there's a bunch of rebates rolling out, and they're just a really great energy efficient uh, appliance. So we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive into what they are. So what are the benefits of an air source heat pump? There's a really long list of them. They provide steady comfort because they're really good at maintaining a good temperature. And for some types of air source heat pumps, you even can do localized heating and cooling. And so you can adjust based on room what you want the temperature to be. Additionally, they lower your energy bills because they're very, very efficient. They provide some dehumidification. They're very quiet. They're, as I said before, very efficient. And there's a lot of great utility and Inflation Reduction Act rebates that are being rolled out right now. And finally, they're very flexible. And we'll get a little more into that. But depending on what you have for heating and cooling now in your home, there is an air source heat pump that will work well to integrate and replace your current system without being a lot of extra additional work. So how does that work? Basically, at the most bare bones level, it's a lot like an air conditioning unit, except for it can also operate in reverse. And so when it's cooling, it's like an air conditioner. And then when it's heating, it just reverses how it's pulling the air. And so it's just like two in one. It efficiently heats and cools with electricity. And it does this by moving heat instead of making heat. In traditional electric resistance or forced air heaters, they are creating the heat from nothing. But air source heat pumps instead move that heat, and so it takes a lot less energy. So it provides up to three times more heat energy to a home than the electrical energy that it uses. Super efficient. And so because they're so efficient, you can save a lot of money from that. Heating in Minnesota is, of course, one of our largest energy bill costs. Uh, this past winter, literally half of our year was winter cold months. And so that is a lot of our bills is going towards heating. And so it makes a lot of economic sense to switch to an air source heat pump. 
especially if you have electric resistance heat or propane, because those are the ones that are making heat. And so if you switch to an air source heat pump from electric resistant, which is baseboard heat, things along those lines, you can save upwards of 55% in energy savings. And then if you heat with propane, you can save upwards of 30%. Uh, for homes with natural gas, natural gas is actually pretty efficient, and so where you really stand to save money is instead in the cooling area instead, since air source heat pumps both heat and cool. And so they're just really great for saving you some money. And if your heating system or cooling system is looking like it's going to be done sometime in the next years, now's the time to start planning to use an air source heat pump instead when you need to replace your furnace or cooling system. So when you look to get an air source heat pump, there are mainly two different options that you'd be choosing between. There's a ductless or mini split, or there's a central inducted, and we're going to go a little bit into what each of those are. So a ductless or mini split heat pump doesn't require ductwork, that's why it's ductless, and it provides individually controlled indoor units. I mentioned it briefly at the beginning, but this is the one where you see it up on a wall and you can change what temperature you want for the specific area that it heats, and so you can change what part of the house you want like a certain temperature or so cool. And so it creates that zoned heating and cooling that really maximizes energy savings and comfort at the same time. And so installation costs for this is between 3,500 to 1,200. And it's a really good fit if you have radiators, in-floor heat, electric baseboard, because you don't have that ductwork already in your house. And so you don't want to spend the extra money to get that ductwork usually, and this doesn't require ductwork. And so it's a really great option if you're looking to replace those existing heat sources, or if you're adding cooling or getting rid of a window AC unit. On the contrast, there's central or ducted heat pumps, which use, of course, ductwork. And they usually, when they're looking to put these in, you have existing ductwork already in your home. And so they'll connect it to indoor furnace fans that already are in your home. And it looks a lot like an AC unit, but it also heats. That added bonus of having the two-way system. And so the installation cost for these is around 4,500 to eight thousand dollars and so it's good fit like mentioned before if you have forced air as it has that duct work or if you're replacing a central ac or adding to it for the first time so if you're looking to install an air source heat pump here's a few next steps you want to first tighten up and insulate your home all of the stuff that morgan was talking about really good because if you can really air seal up your home, then you really are maximizing all of the savings that you're getting from your air source heat pump being so energy efficient. And we really want to make sure that you maximize those savings. And so you might want to consider getting a home energy audit. Additionally, you want to check for electric utility rebates. And when the IRA rebates roll out, you'll also want to check for those. And then you want to get two to three bids from skilled contractors. And so we're going to talk just shortly about skilled contractors. We have a number of, you want to make sure that you have a list of questions to ask contractors. Uh, you'll find that on our website when we mention that in the next slide. And so you want to make sure you know what to ask them. Check that they're NATE certified, which is the North American Technician Excellence. It's an organization that certifies HVAC technicians. So you want to see if they're NATE certified or similarly credentialed. We suggest that you get two to three bids from different companies, and then you want to use a preferred contractor network likely. And so we have the link to that that's going to be shared in the chat. And they've received Minnesota specific training, which is good because oftentimes we specifically need cold climate air source heat pumps in Minnesota so that they're efficient in our colder temperatures.
So we've got some great resources on our website that we suggest you go and check out if you want to read up more on air source heat pumps. Additionally, we have Ask Alexis, which is one of our fellow co-workers who answers all of your more specific questions about if I have this type of heating or cooling system and I want to switch to an air source heat pump, what are my best options? So she goes into all of the nitty gritty details on that. And so now we're going to talk just a little bit briefly about the Inflation Reduction Act. There is a lot in the Inflation Reduction Act, so this is just a little introduction, but we're really excited about all of the great rebates and tax credits coming out on this, including ones on air source heat pumps. And so we just wanted to mention a little bit what you can be looking forward to on that. So right now, we're awaiting federal guidance for these rebate programs. We're expecting that by late 2023, early 2024, that we'll receive guidelines on how to roll them out. And then you'll be able to access these different rebate programs for your own homes. So this is a great time to start planning. And so let's look a little into what you can look forward to. So first off is the Homes Rebates Program. These are for homeowners and multifamily building owners. And this is a whole house improvement rebate. It's looking at the entire energy uses of your house when you're making energy efficiency improvements. And so you'll receive a rebate based on how much energy you save for your house when you make an energy efficiency improvement. They'll be looking at how much your energy use is usage decreases when you install, say, an air source heat pump or some other energy efficiency upgrade. And this will determine uh, how much money you get, and it will either be a modeled or measured approach. If it's a modeled approach, a contractor will use the software to forecast the overall energy savings of the project you're taking on. If it's a measured approach, a contractor would first measure how much energy you consume before you do the project. And then once you complete the project, they'll see how much energy you saved between those two times. And then based on that, for either of these approaches, if your energy savings are 20%, you get a rebate of $2,000. And if your energy savings are 35% or more, the rebate is $4,000. And the exciting thing is, is that if your household is low or moderate income, which is defined as your income being below 80% of the area median income, these rebates double. And so you get extra from that. Additionally, there are the HEVRA rebate programs, and this is more looking at the specific items that you would be purchasing. So the rebates cover the costs of building electrification upgrades, both for installation and the cost of equipment. And so we have listed here the maximum amounts that you can receive per type of item, and it adds up to upwards of $14,000 that you could get in rebates. These rebates are mainly for those that are low to moderate income, and the amount you get is based on where you fall in that range. So you get 100% of the amounts listed if your income is less than 80% of the area median income, and 50% of this amount if your income is between 80 to 150% of area median income. These are point of sale rebates, which is like extra exciting because what that means is that when you go to purchase the item, you receive the item, the rebate right when you're getting the item and they reduce the price when you go to purchase it. And so it reduces your upfront cost and it's just very exciting because it makes it very accessible. For renters, if you're concerned about how this may be applicable for you because some things are more permanent and you can't always take them with you, we suggest that you look and see if there are some portable appliances. This might be, for example, an induction cooktop and air source heat pumps for your window. Um, just exploring what there might be for portable options that also qualify for this. However, if you are someone with an income over 150% of the area median income, tax credits are actually where you're going to get these energy savings. So we're just going to go very briefly over this. The tax credits 
function very similar to Hira, except for it's a tax credit, not a rebate. And so you get it afterwards and it comes off of how much you pay in taxes. And so the maximum annual cap for this would be 3,200 or up to 30% tax credit. And so this is an annual cap, which means you can plan out when you're going to make all of these different energy efficiency upgrades and maximize your cap every year. And it's broken down into a 1,200 maximum tax credit for building envelope, and then a 2,001 for any combination of air source heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and such. And so those add up to the 3,200 cap that I mentioned before. The Department of Energy created a savings hub for homeowners. This can help you determine what qualifies for this tax credit and how to determine if you will receive the tax credits and all other questions related to them. And we're going to share that link in the chat. I'll pop that in when I'm done with my slides. And so there's all sorts of great rebates and tax credits that Ultimately, everyone is covered by either the rebate programs or the tax credit programs so that you can have access to some of these cost savings when you're making improvements in your own home. And so, of course, you can learn more at our website. We have a great Inflation Reduction Act page that has all sorts of information on it above and beyond what I talked to you about today, including EV tax credits, and solar tax credits. And so we really recommend that you check out our IRA page and get an idea of all of the different great things that you can access from the IRA. Thank you, Caitlin and Morgan and Jordan. Uh, hello again, everyone. My name is Dominic. Uh, I am in the Northwest Minnesota RSDP region in Crookston, and now we're gonna face energy burdens in our neighborhood and with our community members. Uh, so this might be the first time that you're hearing of an energy burden, but this just means how much of a household's income is dedicated to utility bills. So there are regions in Minnesota that spend five to 10 times the national, the national average just to heat and, and cool their homes. This is attributed to systems that are not efficient or equipped for the Minnesota elements. There's just not a ton of time in the state where you can just have the screen door open. Uh, we live in extremes and it's one of those compounding issues that without updating your heating and cooling in your home, it can get very expensive as the, as the months roll on. Uh, a few slides ago, you saw an image of utility bill or groceries. Uh, the latest client report from the Minnesota Food Shelf Survey found that in the past year, 38% of food shelf shoppers said they had to choose between uh, their utility bills and food. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, include that just for some, for some context as to uh, who this uh, is really affecting. Uh, and that's why we're shooting for under 5% of uh, income being spent on, on energy. So we're going to take a minute here for just another little pop quiz. What does EAP stand for? You can put your answer in the chat. I'm going to say it is not all of the above. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm liking what I see. Yeah, A team, you've got the right answer. It is energy assistance program. So your local energy assistance program and weatherization assistance program are both resources to help pay energy bills and finance weatherization for homes, which um, the weatherization includes roofing and insulation and, and your heating and cooling systems. These, like most of the other programs that we've mentioned, come at an income qualified cost. So Rose has provided the link for us to check out the opportunities in your area. Like I've mentioned before, CERTS has comprehensive guides 
on our website for navigating home energy for all different types of homeowners. They're available in many different languages and they are customizable in that you can just plop your organization's logo right on there and uh, distribute them to your service area. In addition to written guides, if you scroll to the bottom of that web page, you'll see CERTS has videos for energy efficiency, focusing on ensuring the building envelope keeps the outside temperature different from the inside temperature. Uh, air leaks, I'm reminded of those late night uh, uh, commercials are like dollar bills flying out of your wallet, flying out of the out of the crevices in the walls and doors, especially in winter months. One of the types of homes that CERTS focuses on are uh, manufactured homes, also called mobile homes. Uh, here, these videos cover maintenance and ways to increase efficiency and in cutting down energy bills for manufactured homes in uh, manufactured home parks. We also have slide decks to guide in-depth conversation about energy use. So this is the moment I'm, I'm sure everybody's been waiting for. Uh, who the heck do I contact uh, of these fine people at CERTS to spread this valuable info to my household, to my community, to my overall service area? Melissa Birch, who has been uh, active in the chat, um, thankfully, and talking to uh, some of uh, the, the, the people um, providing input. Uh, her contact info is right there. And this is, uh, this is how you, you get started. I'm going to uh, launch our second poll here. This is just, again, a little poll about the takeaways from this presentation. We will give um, about a minute for that, but you know, like what it says, what uh, from what you've learned today, what are some of the steps that you plan on uh, implementing in your house or uh, recommending to other people? Now, if, um, if Rose could launch that, that would be wonderful using LED light bulbs. That was one. I saw somebody in the chat uh, as well. Somebody said that, that uh, they will use less um, or they, they don't give off as much heat. That is, that is also true. That's right, solar, great investment, new uh, insulation. Yep, setting water heater to 120 degrees. You don't need it higher than that. And, uh, you know, if it is higher than that, that increases the risks of um, burning, especially on um, sensitive skin. A few more seconds here. Can everybody see these results or do I have to still share them? Yeah, I can see them. Okay. Yeah, setting water heater, free cooling by opening windows at night, yep. And using LED bulbs. There's a lot of different ways that you can get them and you can find uh, ways on the CERTS website. That concludes our prepared um, portion of the presentation and we'll now take some time for some Q and A's. You can feel free to let them fly off mute or to type them in the chat. And uh, we four and Melissa Birch will do our best to uh, answer them. So I see the question about wood heat uh, in the uh, chat there. And that's that's a great question, especially in some of our rural areas. A lot of folks use wood heat. In fact, I use wood heat. 
Um, you want to make sure that you have kind of a, a one of the higher efficiency um, wood stoves to use uh, to reduce the amount of particulate matter that is is given off um, in the wood heat. And uh, there are some technologies as well for wood gasification. Um, so that's something to investigate as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's on the wood heat. Uh, I saw another question of, is it a smart idea to turn the AC completely off when not at home, or does the system have to work harder at night to bring the living area temperature back down? I don't have an answer with uh, scientific facts in there. So if any of my coworkers do, feel free to interrupt me. But um, I have found that if I know I'm not going to be at home during the day and I close all the blinds and um, turn the fans off, then I don't think the AC has to work any harder at night. But I haven't, uh, I haven't measured. So to depend on the temperature outside and so when we're getting really hot in Minnesota in summer uh, it's going to work quite a lot in order to cool down your house if it's completely off and so that's why they recommend that instead of turning it off you turn the temperature up more so it's just working less to cool the house actively and then it doesn't have to make that really strong push when you return back home at the evening. In regards to uh, water heater for heating, I think Ask, Ask Alexis might have some questions that they've answered in regards to water heaters for heating and replacing them with heat pumps. Uh, I don't know the technical details of how exactly each of those systems work and what would go into replacing them, but um, Overall, we suggest that if it's looking like your heating system is reaching the end of its life expectancy, that then you start to look and see at what options would work best for using an air source heat pump, because we want to make sure that you use your current system up to its end of life and then go forward with replacing it. Melissa, do you have a little more input? Yeah, I, I would say um, there are being developed um, air to water heat pumps so you would so that will be an option going forward but it's not super common yet um, it might be the kind of thing where you would do like a uh, a mini split rather than a ducted heating and cooling uh, heat pump um, that would be it would be worth replacing it with a heat pump here, replacing your AC with a heat pump, because the heat pump is going to be more efficient than replacing it with just another regular AC unit. Um, so yeah, go go with the go with the uh, mini split would probably be your best option. And additionally, with those rebates from both utilities and the IRA, it's a really it's going to be a really great time once they roll out to get one. And so you can really maximize your cost savings. Yeah, I'd like to add to the Inflation Reduction Act a portion of the CERT's website has a lot of different scenarios and uh, different for different kinds of homeowners and different kind of um, home situations. And so we would love to uh, promote that. And we, the, the communications team at at certs works tirelessly um, updating that information when it's um, when it's announced by by our federal government more and more.
So I can also add a little bit about um, if if your upper level is staying really warm, um, as was asked in the chat, um, you might consider a couple of things. One thing would be to look at your insulation um, as being potentially something that could be improved um, so that you have a better, um, less, less heat infiltration during the summer. Um, the other thing you could look into if, if your insulation is okay is to look at a mini split or it might also be good to have an HVAC contractor look at your ductwork um, to see if there's something changes that should be made to the ductwork so that it can um, better cool both the, the first floor and the second floor, the upper floor. So hopefully that made sense. This is a backup on a question from a while ago, but someone was checking to see if LED light bulbs should go in the trash. Um, while they don't have mercury in them, they still should not go in the trash. Um, largely anything breakable, like that is going to be glass, should not just go loose in your trash can. Um, if it is just plain glass, you can put it in a paper bag and staple it and put that in the recycling if your recycling takes glass. But LED light bulbs can actually be recycled. Um, a lot of those little small components in there that help make them so efficient can be reused. Um, so certain hardware stores will recycle LED light bulbs as well as um, certain uh, sanitary districts. I'm fairly certain the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District does take LED light bulbs, they definitely take your old mercury filled light bulbs. In fact, there's a billboard on 35 advertising that they want your mercury. So be even more sustainable and recycle too. And yes, the link for this video will be available. I'm going to give time for just one more question, and then we can uh, I can help us all close out here. I'm not familiar with heat pumps connected to thermal batteries, but uh, has anyone else heard about them here? <laughs> That is a great question. I don't know that I have seen a, a heat pump connected with a thermal battery, but it certainly makes uh, a ton of sense. And so there may definitely be some applications out there. If if anybody you know who's on the webinar has seen that application, um, please you know throw it in the chat because we'd love to um, we'd love to learn more about it because it does make a ton of sense. Thank you, Michael, for pointing out about the split foyer homes um, and for uh, other, other commentary throughout. Putting a door thick curtain at the bottom of the stairs can help also. Thank you, uh, everybody. In our last uh, few minutes here, I'm gonna, I'll have the link for evaluations. Uh, remember, for this, uh, this series is called the No Place Like Home series. You can request a certificate of participation. And if you're looking for wellness points after you request them, they'll be added to your employee accounts on the first Tuesday of the month after the webinar. So just be patient and they'll show up the first Tuesday in July, which is the, which is the fourth. So more to celebrate, I guess. Here are the uh, remaining webinars. Um, we've got 
the QR code uh, to be scanned there, as well as the link to those. I'll leave that up for a second. And here is ex extensions uh, social media accounts. Um, we invite parents and caregivers to sign up for the you got this uh, text messaging to receive two text messages a week throughout the school year on topics of health and nutrition, developmental affirmations, parenting and school engagement, mental health and well being, and financial capability in English or Spanish. And finally, all of these recordings of these webinars will be posted to the Family Development YouTube channel. So you'll get an email with this recording. And um, and we'll see you over on YouTube if you want to watch it there as well. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Um, if for any reason anybody wanted to stay behind and ask just a few more questions um, before the hour is up, please do. But thank you so much for listening.